phenomenon. I think people with phantom limbs are feeling the field of their missing limb. It's where the, field, the limb should be. And that's where the phantoms experience. People can move around their phantom limbs. And one of my experiments at the moment is trying to detect phantom limbs, the field of the limb. Um, um, you can read about that in my book, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. It's a very good, a very simple experiment. And any of you involved in subtle healing might like to consider trying it. It costs nothing and it's fun to do. Um, here's a form of regeneration that's even more remarkable. This was done deliberately in the laboratory uh, with the eye of a newt. The lens was surgically removed from the eye of a newt to produce a form of damage that would never normally happen in nature. What happens is that the edge of the iris forms a new lens and regenerates a per perfect functional eye. Now, in the embryonic development of a newt, the lens does not form from the edge of the iris. It forms from a folding in of skin on the outside. So it's formed a lens in a completely new way from a different tissue from where it would normally arise from, showing uh, that there seems to be a plan of the complete eye uh, that take away the lens, that plan is still there, and it enables the uh, regeneration process to occur. Um, an important concept in the understanding of morphogenetic fields was put forward by the British biologist uh, C.W. Waddington. Uh, Waddington uh, had the idea of a creode, which is a canalized pathway of change. It's as if this is the embryo. It roll, rolls down valleys towards the lowest points. Uh, these represent different organs in the body. The, what this illustrates is that the, it's attracted towards the end state, the fully formed organ, which acts as an, an attractor. In the language of modern dynamics, morphogenetic fields contain attractors which attract the developing system towards that end or goal. If you push the wall up the valley, if you disturb the normal course of development, as in the case of the dragonfly embryo cutting a bit of the egg off, what happens is that it rolls back to the normal pathway of development. These walls mean that even after disturbance, it can get back onto the normal course and ends up in the normal endpoint. So the creode is an important part. Morphogenetic fields are not static. They contain virtual future forms uh, which attract the developing organism towards them. As a, as a seedling develops towards a tree, the mature form of the tree is the attractor for that seedling. As an embryo develops towards an adult, the adult form is the attractor for that developmental process. And it pulls it towards uh, this goal. Um, the modeling of morphogenetic fields in mathematical terms has been done by uh, a great French mathematician, René Tom, who... Um, put together this whole attractor theory of fields. Uh, the attractor uh, mathematics is the basis of chaos theory and a number of other important branches of modern dynamics. But this is the mathematical nature of these fields. The other important general point about fields is that they're hierarchically organized. They exist in nested hierarchies, parts within holes, which are holes within the, this this hole, which includes these parts, is a part of this hole. That's part of this hole. These could be subatomic particles in atoms, atoms in molecules, molecules in crystals. Or they could be organelles in cells, cells in tissues, tissues in organs, organs in organisms, organisms in societies. Everywhere you look in nature, there are levels of organization, the parts of one are holes that they're in their own in their own level, containing parts which are also holes at a lower level. Arthur Kerstler called these holons, and he called the, this pattern of organization a holarchy. Um, you could also call it a nested hierarchy. The higher level is a level that includes the lower levels. It's a bit like those addresses that some of us wrote as children. You know, the house, the street, the town, the county, England, UK, Europe, the world, the universe, and so on. Um, there's always a higher level of organization, and each contains lower levels. And the point about holistic science is that it recognizes that nature's made up of a series of levels or holes. Reductionist science, still the predominant uh, form within universities, 
tries to reduce everything to the smallest possible thing. That's why in biology, molecular biology is the most prestigious and important and best funded branch of the subject because molecules are the smallest things. It's why in physics, particle physics is the best funded branch because these evanescent particles that last only tiny fractions of a second are, are, are the smallest and most elusive things. You have to build apparatus costing billions of euros in order to study them um, because they're the smallest things. And the reason why people bother is because they think that's where the answer lies and the smallest things. Holistic science tells us that's not the case. There's a whole series of levels and to understand any level you have to study things at their own level. So morphogenetic fields uh, exist in the nested hierarchy. The field of an organelle is inside the field of a cell, the field of a cell inside the field of the tissue, the field of the tissue inside the field of the organ. And these fields work on the fields of lower level systems, giving them order, structure and pattern. So this is a general overview of the nature of morphogenetic fields. And I suggest that that's just one kind of organizing field. The nervous system is highly indeterminate in its behavior, and that is organized by another set of fields, the behavioral fields. Mental activity is organized by mental fields. Social groups like flocks of birds or termite colonies are organized by social fields. All these kinds of fields are what I call morphic fields. Uh, morphic field is the general category of which Morphogenetic field is one species. It's the kind of field concerned with the development of form in animals and plants and crystals. Uh, the behavior is governed by behavioral fields, social organization by social fields, and so forth. So these are all different kinds of morphic field. Now, how do morphic fields have the form they have? And how do they work? Well, I don't have time to go into all the details, but roughly speaking, how they work is by imposing pattern or structure on otherwise indeterminate or chaotic processes. Everything in nature is, except for some human machines, is pretty well indeterminate. Uh, chaos theory and quantum theory have revealed to us that the old illusion of science that everything is in principle totally predictable is not true. It was just an illusion. Um, most of nature is very unpredictable. That's why even with satellite photos, the weather forecasters don't always get it right. Because the weather is a chaotic system. It doesn't obey simple deterministic principles. Nor do breaking waves, nor do nervous systems, nor do biological organisms. Everything's probabilistic. If you look at all the different leaves on a particular tree, they all have the same genes, they have the same uh, morphic fields. Yet every leaf is different. Um, the vein pattern is different on every leaf. They're even different on different sides of the same leaf. They all have the same general form, the same probability structure, but they're individually different. Morphic fields impose pattern on probabilistic processes. They impose pattern on developing organisms. They impose pattern on the activity of the nervous system. Uh, so they underlie behavior as well. And um, they also organize, underlie social organization. So how do they get the form themselves? Is this all programmed in the genes? Well, no, because genes, we know what they do. They code for proteins. They enable us to make the particular proteins that our bodies contain. That's all. Some of them are involved in the control of protein synthesis. They don't explain the form of an organism. The genes give us the components that we have in our bodies, a bit like the components in a TV set, they're essential for that TV set to work properly. If you have defective components, the set doesn't work properly. But the pictures on the, uh, you see on the screen and the sounds you hear are not arising from those components by themselves. They depend on an invisible field to which the set is tuned. And that's the same with organisms. The inheritance of form and behavior depends on morphic fields. So how do these fields uh, evolve? Living organisms evolve. And science, old-style science, isn't really a very evolutionary subject. We now know the entire cosmos is evolutionary. Um, but how do fields evolve? They can't just be in the genes because they're what organize the genes. So they can't be inherited genetically. They can't just be platonic equations, uh, equations somehow beyond time and space, because fields evolve. Dinosaurs came into being, they're now extinct. 
Um, animals, birds evolved from dinosaurs, the fields of birds evolved, they weren't all there at the moment of the Big Bang or even at the origin of life on Earth. How do they evolve and change in time? They have a kind of history within them. The suggestion I make is that morphic fields have a kind of memory given by a process called morphic resonance. Um, morphic resonance is the influence of similar patterns of activity on subsequent similar patterns of activity across space and time. What matters is similarity. It doesn't matter about distance in space and time. Anything that's happened before in a self-organizing system uh, will make it easier for that to happen again. So there's a kind of collective memory in every kind of thing. Each species of plant has a kind of collective memory. Each species of animals has a kind of collective memory, a memory of form, of the way the organism develops, and of behavior. The collective memory of animals uh, are their instincts, their inherited patterns of behavior. And we, of course, have a collected, collective memory as well. It's what Jung called the collective unconscious. So this collective memory um, is a key feature of all of nature. The whole of nature is really a matter of habit. Um, and I see the so-called laws of nature as more like habits. Well, I think, in fact, whether we like it or not, that's a view everybody's going to have to consider sooner or later. Old-style science was based on the, the idea that the laws of nature are completely fixed. That they thought, they used to think nature is eternal. The laws of nature are eternal, matter and energy are eternal, and it's just a matter of um, things just repeating in endless cycles and so forth. But evolution tells us something completely different. The laws of nature can't be eternal, the universe is not eternal. So the laws of nature are not eternal, and if the whole universe is evolving, at least the laws have to evolve, but better than law is the idea of habit. So I'm suggesting the laws of nature are more like habits. Um, the morphic fields have a kind of inherent memory. So <clears throat> everything has this kind of memory, even crystals. What this means is that if you make a new kind of crystal that's never existed before, there won't be a morphic field for that crystal form. You have to wait for one to come into being. <clears throat> but if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you keep crystallizing the same thing over and over again, making crystals all over the world, it'll get easier and easier to crystallize. Things will form more readily. This is known to happen in the case of crystals. They get easier to crystallize the more, the more often they're made. Chemists usually explain this by saying that fragments of previous crystals get travel, travel around the world on the clothing or beards of migrant chemists. <laughs> and, <clears throat> infect crystallization dishes in other laboratories. Or if there haven't been any migrant chemists, they move around as invisible dust particles in the atmosphere. But what I'm saying is this would still happen even if uh, the dust particles are filtered out and if migrant chemists are rigorously excluded. Uh, things will get easier to crystallize because of morphic resonance. There's a habit of building up in nature. Now, I think this happens at all levels, not just in crystals, it happens in biological form. Um, whenever um, a habit builds up, it means that things are influenced by all the previous systems. So the more there are, the greater the number of influences. There's a cumulative memory. All the previous systems are slightly different. So it's a kind of probability structure. This illustrates uh, this probability structure of morphic fields with the analogy of composite photographs. These are average scientists from the John Innes Institute in Norwich, uh, made by superimposing the photos of female and male scientists. And so we get an average scientist's face from the John Innes Institute. <clears throat> I think one thing we can guess is that they were predominantly white. Um, and so uh, anyway, this, if you could see the morphic field of a scientist at the John Innes Institute, it would be a bit like this, a kind of blurred, average, probabilistic structure. So uh, these fields uh, include the memory of everything that's happened before of that kind. It's a kind of collective memory. Now I'm just going to talk about a few experiments that relate to this. This uh, is a normal fruit fly. Um, and this is a mutant fruit fly where the balancing organs, the halteres, have been transformed into an extra pair of wings. 
These flies with four wings are a bit like